Well, hello everyone, this is Al-Fadi. Welcome back to a continuation of this series on Mecca. If you rely on the uh, standard Islamic narrative concerning Mecca, uh, we discover quickly that the facts, uh, that are the facts, I should say, uh, data outside of the Quran and other findings, at least recent findings, contradict that particular narrative. Of course, uh, with me here uh, today in studio to unpack all of these problems, including today's problem that has to do with the trade route and the connection with Mecca, is our dear brother, Dr. J. Dr. J, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, tell us about yet another problem that has to do with Mecca, which is the trade route. Yeah, so obviously we've already gone through the maps showing it didn't exist geographically on any map. Uh, we've gone through the Kiblis, which proof categorically Gad Gibson showed that it did. there's no mosque facing it up until 727, over 100 years uh, after it was canonized by him in 621, supposedly, or 624. So th here is the difficulty. They've got to find some reference for this city. Muslims are desperate. Mm -hmm. And to their aid came Dr. Montgomery Watt in the last century. Montgomery Watt came and says, oh, I've got the solution. The solution is very simple. It was the center of trade. Now, we know this, the traditions, the standard Islamic n tr narratives is very clear that Muhammad was a trader. That's what he did. That's how he got, that's how, that was his business. Khadija, his first wife, was a trader. She right, and he was the him. business manager for her, right? Exactly. And so he was trading on north, south, east, and west. He went up to Gaza, you name it, he was there. So obviously, if the standard Islamic narrative is correct, then Mecca has to be the center of trade. And that is a given. Every Muslim knows that since they're a knee to a grasshopper, that Mecca was a center of trade. Mm -hmm. Montgomery Watt came to their aid. And let me just go through and what, let's, we'll, we'll put up right here. Let's look at a picture and let's look at the map. So this is how the trade route theory goes. Now, according to all the Muslims, according to the Westerners, everything that we have been taught, all the trade was coming here from China and India, and it needed to get over there. It needed to get over to the Mediterranean because that was where the, that was where the civilized world was. How do they get from here to there? Well, they couldn't go this direction because look, you have all the mountains here. You That's have right. the Hindu Kush here, and you have the Himalayas. This is where I grew up. I grew up right there. And this is where I spent my first 12 years of school. So I know this area and it's impenetrable. So it had to come across the plateau here over down to the western coast of India. And from here it went across, and let's just do an arrow follow it, it went across the Arabian Sea up the Persian Gulf here, and then from here, what used to, what be later became Basra, today it's Basra, and there was a trans ship right across the Iraq, right across Syria, over to Lebanon, over to Israel, and to Gaza, and places like that, uh, and then to the Mediterranean. So that was the trade route theory that Montgomery Watt talked about, and everybody, I've heard it, you've heard it, all my schooling has been on that trade route theory. Until Patricia Corona, back in the 1980s, she looked at it and says, hold on a minute, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. And here's the difficulty. You have the Sassanians, right? There they are right there. These are the Persians. Mm -hmm. And then you had the Byzantines up there. So the Byzantines are up there. They shut it down. So the Byzantines says, because they were going to war. When you go to war, that becomes very dangerous. Now, now, because it's so dangerous, they had to shut it down. So we put an X there and we shut down that trade route. Now, there's no more long trade there because no trade could go up through the Persian Gulf. It had to be redirected. So what Montgomery Watt had said was this. This is what Montgomery Watt. Okay, so that got shut down because of the wars that were going on from the 5th and the 6th century up until the 7th century. For 200 years, back and forth, Byzantine Sassanians, you come this direction. And so we're going to put it here. And this is what he went. He came down from to the, to to the Aden, Arabian Sea over to Aden. Right. And redirecting it this way from Aden, it went 12 and 50 miles up to Gaza in the north. So he solved the problem. And of course, all the Muslims were wiping their brows because our good old friend Montgomery Watt now proved that Mecca, which is right here, had to be at the center of the trade because that is, they were the control of the trade both north and south. And of course, as the Muslim standard Islamic narrative says, not only did they control the trade north and south, they also controlled it east and west. Patricia Crone looked at that and she saw a problem. Now, I don't know, can you see a problem with that? Well, I, I see a simple problem. Look where Mecca is positioned. Well, we have mountains. You have the plateau, you're right. Yeah. And she noticed that. She says, hold on a minute. Now let's just look, and this is what she said. All right, let's take away that 
1,250 miles by land. And let's look and see what that is. If you look at it carefully, there's a plateau there. You see the Western Plateau? Mm -hmm. And we know very well that it went up from Aden here, and it would have gone up to Taif there. But according to the standard Islamic narrative, it would have taken a detour off the plateau down to Mecca here. So you can see Taif is right here where that circle is. And you see there's a detour down to Mecca, which is 1,000 meters down. She said, why would they go a thousand meters down and then from there it would come back up to Yathrib? So that's Yathrib there where that circle is, right? And then from Yathrib up to Gaza in the north. Can you see a detour there? It's pretty obvious. Abs exactly. It's almost like you're forcing the narrative to have Mecca included if you want to follow something like this. On top of that, she also knew that Mecca had nothing to accommodate any caravans. If you have caravans of camels, you need to have food, which means you have to have vegetation. You need to have water, which is what not only gives you the vegetation, Mecca has neither of the two. It is as barren as you can get. There was nothing there would have accommodated. That's why all the oases are up along the Western Plateau because that's the only place where there was vegetation. But that's way away from the coast, and it's a good thousand meters and up above both Mecca, or where you were uh, born and grew up in Jeddah. So she said, why hadn't anybody looked at a map before when they, when they agreed to this? So here's the genius of Patricia Krona. She Remember what I said to me earlier, she reads and writes 15 languages. So she went back to the trades documents, which is what anybody should do if you're a historian, and in her case, a linguist, I've been able to learn and understand these are archaic languages like Syriac, and this is uh, uh, Nabataean Aramaic. These are the languages which are no longer used today, and she could read them. Uh, and because of that, she went to the trading documents, and this is what she found. Because now let's get back to what you noticed. What did you notice wrong about this trade route that you didn't like? As I mentioned, you know, if you use the sea all the way, why would you stop just right here? You can drop off some, uh, you know, loads in Aden and just keep on going and start stopping at the different uh, uh, locations. Ports. That's right. You yeah. keep on board ship. Yeah. Listen, she found out that if you take a ton of goods just 50 miles by land, it would cost the same amount as 1,250 miles by sea. Even today, do we not use the sea whenever we take large, uh, huge amounts of good? In fact, you know what just happened a few weeks ago right up there in the Suez Canal when one of those ships blocked it, went sideways, and the how that just caused enormous amount of, of uh, repercussions all across the whole world, especially for Europe, because if you block the Suez Canal for a, a week, or two weeks or say a month, you're going to destroy the shipping because all the ships, even today in the modern world, the vast majority of our goods go by ship. It is so cheap. Right. Secondly, you don't have to worry about brigands. You don't have to worry about feeding camels. You don't have to worry about watering. All you need is wind, which blows the sails. So the Red Sea would have made absolute sense. So she went back to the trading documents over here in the west coast of India, and she went back and found out that all the trade went this way. Let's go back and see what she found. And it's fascinating because it's it, it my 10-year-old son actually understood this. So she, she said it went this way across the Arabian Sea, that's why I'm making it with green arrows. It went around, some of them you could stop at Aden to get re supplies. Course, no one, said, course, I mean, no one uh, suggests you don't stop at Aden. Right. But you didn't stop there and, and trans take everything off board there. You would stay on board ship and what they did is they went to Agilis. See Agilis there? Yeah. That's where they went to. And then from Agilis, they went across up the Red Sea all the way up to Petra. And then from Petra, they went to Gaza. So can you see this then? And from there, they went all over the Mediterranean. Which is at the corner of the Mediterranean. It makes sense. That makes sense. This is, and she just completely debunked the trade route theory back in 1987 with a book she wrote called Meccan Trade and the Rise of Islam. And, and that, remember, back then there was no Swiss Canal, so they, they had to do this kind of stoppage here and take it from there. That's why they went up the Gulf of Aqaba, and then from the Gulf of Aqaba, what is today now? I think it's Islet now? Right, yeah. That's where they went then on up then to uh, Through the Petra. Mediterranean too. yeah. Petra's going to come very important. We've already talked about Petra because Petra was not only where all the mosques were facing, it was a center of trade at that time. It was Petra that dominated the train. And the reason why is because of the Red Sea. Right. Now, that debunked it there in uh, what you may call uh, back in the 1987. But hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. She said that it went up the Red, the Red Sea, right? She said that all the trade read from the Red Sea in 1987. 
we've just learned something new. And I'm going to introduce that in the next episode. Because the next episode, I'm going to confront even Patricia Krohn now with something we have just discovered this year in 2021. But I'm going to let you hold off on that because I'm going to now confront your city, Jeddah. Because in order to go up the Red Sea, you have to have ports along the Arabian coast, right? Jeddah to support Mecca, Yanbu to support Yathrib. Yeah, through, yeah. And right. we need to explain to people why this is important. And I'm, be, uh, me being someone who uh, grew up in Jeddah, by the way, my, my, uh, I was born and, and lived near the port, actually. I mean, it was like five minutes walk to the port itself. So it is a port city. Uh, port is important. I've seen, you know, uh, merchandise and everything else come through that, uh, whether uh, being exported or being imported. So you need a gateway into the inland, you know. So how can you get the inland without having a port city? That's what Eden would do for Yemen. That's what Jeddah would do, for instance, for, uh, you know, the inland from the Hijaz area. And the same thing for Yambo. You'll find the same thing over there on uh, uh, the Arabian Gulf or the Persian Gulf. So port cities are intended to be the gateway for entrance of goods. So Because everything goes by sea. Right. Exactly. I mean, that's what it uh, proves the importance of sea. I mean, I, you just think about it. I mean, uh, would it be better off to offload everything in Eden and risk now using camels and going through the danger of, lo uh, you know, basically being robbed and so many other things? Or you just put, you know, certain loads for Eden and other loads for Jeddah and other loads for Yumba and so on and so forth. Yeah. The great yeah. thing about sea is you can see your enemies coming towards you a long distance away. And more than that, you can either outrace them or more than that, you can pretty well defend yourself. And that's why right. sea was always the chosen way of transportation, has been for millennia. It still is today. Now. With that in mind, I'm going to introduce in the next episode something you have never seen before. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't want to really take my thunder away because we're going to do something to your city that you've grown up with that you're not going to like. But that's for the next episode. Well, uh, folks, uh, until we meet next time to explore this new information, and, and I'm being now uh, serious, uh, definitely this is something new that we will be addressing for the first time. Um, I think it's, uh, it's exciting to know that there are a lot of data out there, and this is what I meant by the standard Islamic narrative versus data that is out there that we have to faithfully actually explore and find out why is Mecca missing, for instance, for the longest time, if it was indeed the center or at least a prominent commerce center. I mean, uh, wisdom says that if it was that prominent, then somebody would have mentioned it early on, earlier than even the 7th century. It could have been mentioned in the 6th century at least. Even if it was mentioned in the seventh century, we know there is something to refer to Mecca, but that's not what we're finding so far. So we will continue to dig, no pun intended, in order for us to uh, unearth more facts and more data to whether support the standard Islamic narrative or contradict it. And so far, I have to say this, the contradictory side is scoring all the points when it comes to the standard Islamic narrative. With that in mind, we will see you next time to talk now about Jeddah and other port cities along the Red Sea and how that connects to the narrative of Mecca being so prominent in terms of the trade route. Thank you, brother, as always. Thank you, everyone. This is Al-Fadi. God bless you. <laughs>